Hi, I'm Bruce Fenton. This report will discuss where we are, how we got here, the magnitude of change, and what our world may look like as the future unfolds. We are at the end of an epoch. An era that began 100 years ago is now reaching its inevitable conclusion. The last several decades saw changes in society, government, finance, and geopolitics that built the world we know. These changes contributed to the destruction of the old and set the stage for what's next. Change has prepared the way for more change. Many complex factors have aligned to create conditions for a cataclysmic transformation of society. The geopolitics of our world, the mechanics of our financial markets and power structures, and events like the 2008 financial collapse have all laid the groundwork for COVID-19 to impact the world in the manner it has. This has ignited a spark with secondary and nth order effects we are just beginning to see unfold. The actions of the last eight weeks have set into motion an unstoppable chain of events. This will forever transform our lives, our markets, and our world. It's time for new ways of thinking and new ways of solving problems. We must be cautious of the illusion of normalcy. As many of us sit at home relatively comfortably, this seems like a sort of temporary home vacation for some, something which will end in weeks and be followed by a return to normal. Some investors and economists speculate we may see a recession, while others say we may recover in a year or two. Some people assume they will return to their jobs and the revenue will return quickly. I believe that they are simply grasping for an understanding of events which no one alive has a frame of reference for. The measures of where we are today will not be marked as the beginning of a recession or even a depression, but as the end of an era. An epoch is a period where its change from other eras can mark time itself. Make no mistake, our old world is gone, and the way it works is changed forever. As with all such times, the change happened fast, and it is permanent. The world we knew is gone, and we didn't even get to say goodbye. To understand the magnitude of this change and what is ahead, we must understand where we are now, what brought us here, what is happening, and how history has unfolded in times like this. As unique as this is to all people today, this type of cataclysmic change was not uncommon for our forebears. It is inevitable. This report covers the past, the present, and how the future may unfold. The main purpose is to try to help us understand where we are, how big this shift might be, and how we can build a better world moving forward. The Cambridge Dictionary defines frame of reference as a noun, a set of ideas or facts that a person accepts and that influences the person's behavior, opinions, or decisions. Ideas and facts have changed. The world is operating in a new way, so we have no frame of reference for what we are seeing and little ability to predict what is next. Everything will be rewritten. Perspective. History doesn't repeat itself, but often rhymes. This is attributed to Mark Twain, but as with much in our world, we don't know if the attribution is true. History does indeed follow predictable patterns. Likewise, Humans follow predictable paths from birth to old age. We know accurately when most people will learn to walk, get married, peak in their careers, and when they will become grandparents. Demographics are predictable. So are people. So are nations. The world is predictable, 
but the predictions are only as accurate as a rhyme. Generational change and demographics. Every decade sees change. The 1950s are notably different from the 1960s, and the 70s are very different from the 1990s. A generation is a period of about 30 years, the time it takes for children to be born, grow up, and have children of their own. People collectively born around the same time are members of the same generation. As with decades, generations are distinct and marked by their own characteristics. The greatest generation fought in World War II. The silent generation rebuilt. The baby boomers brought us the world we see today. And Generation X, Millennials, and Gen Z all have their own traits and impact. Large generations, such as the baby boomers, tend to transform society. Shopping preferences, housing, political choices, and family and lifestyle preferences of the boomers affected everything from how schools were built to urban development to the internet and the invention of superstores. In the book, The Fourth Turning, Strauss and Howe discuss how generations change and rebel against the previous, each having different attitudes, values, and priorities. These differences shape eras with notable changes in commerce, life, and institutions. About every four generations, every hundred years or so, we tend to see a much more dramatic change, a fourth turning. These times of change are often violent in a literal sense, but they are always violent in impact. These are times when we see massive shifts in how our world works. A fourth turning will see global changes in money, maps, borders, how people think and behave, and what industries and trends are important. Epoch change. Every few hundred years or so, we have a global transformation that is even more cataclysmic. The birth of Christianity, the birth of Islam, the rise of the Roman Empire, its fall and the Dark Ages, the beginning of the Renaissance, the French and American revolutions, and the Industrial Revolution. These were all events of such magnitude that the New World was unrecognizable from what had existed just years before. It is these times where the change itself marks time. This is the epoch shift we are in now. For the rest of our lives, we will refer to the time before the crisis and after as distinct eras, more than dates or decades. What brought us here? 1918. The current situation is not just a COVID-19 crisis. This is a global crisis and the end of an era. COVID-19 was just the event that commenced the inevitable. The origins of this start with the beginning of this, this fourth turning 100 years ago and the 20th century. The Spanish flu of 1918 marked the end of eras which had seen the birth of the United States 142 years earlier through the Industrial Revolution and the Civil War. The Spanish flu was immediately followed by World War I and a world that would never be the same. People born in the early 1900s saw staggering change. A man born in 1900 grew up with no telephone. He probably never saw a car until adulthood. He had a 70% chance of living on a farm and likely never traveled more than 100 miles from his home. At age 20, he would have been in the trenches of France with tanks, mustard gas, aircraft overhead, fighting machines as foreign to us as spacecraft or lasers would be to us. Weimar Republic, Germany, 1918-1933. The Weimar Republic in Germany between World War I and World War II has become a textbook example of bad economic policies and hyperinflation. In order to fund World War I, Germany began printing vast amounts of its currency. 
They also closed every German stock exchange, leaving citizens unable to see the effect that this was having on the market. When World War I came to an end, the Treaty of Versailles laid out high reparation payments for Germany, including demands that they would likely never be able to meet. According to the Mises Institute, by the autumn of 1920, prices were 12 times as high as they had been before the war. The food for a family of four people, which cost 60 marks a week in April 1919, cost 198 marks by September 1920 and 230 marks by November 1920. As things progressively worsened, many Germans were selling their marks to convert to other currencies, such as the U.S. dollar or the British pound sterling. By the end of the war, the amount of money in circulation had risen fourfold and the prices 140%. So five years later, December 1923, the Reichsbank has issued half a quintillion marks or 500 quintillion marks, which had fallen to a trillionth of their value in 1914 gold. So the American dollar is 4.2 trillion marks. American penny is 42 billion marks. And so the value continued to drop further and further for each German mark. They, they continued to keep running the printing press, which then added to the further decline. So the 1980s to today. The end of the Great Wars was followed by the Roaring Twenties and saw decades of massive change in technology and economics. In 1944, a new world order was born at the United Nations Monetary uh, Financial Conference in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, which is my home state. These changes and their effect on the world began, began to manifest most significantly a few decades later by the 1980s. The 1980s saw new uses of debt, a continued drift from sound money, the end of the USSR, and the acceleration of globalization. The baby boomers began to reach productive career years and shape the world from their own leadership roles in the 80s. The decade also formed the building blocks for the 90s, tech revolution, the rise of China, and the internet. This paved the way, in turn, for further credit expansion, even more globalization, and more interconnectedness. By the 2010s, Humanity had unprecedented interconnectedness, choice, selection, ability to travel, customization, on-demand pricing, delivery opportunities, and nearly unlimited credit. We saw many vast improvements in our quality of life, but they came with a cost. The financial strains of continued leverage, deficits, and debt started to reveal significant weaknesses in the system by 2008. In the 2008 financial crisis, a cycle of bad loans on overvalued homes with unqualified home buyers created a hole of debt that led to the insolvency of many major banks. Instead of allowing the banks to fail, the United States government initiated the largest bailout in history at the time, roughly $700 billion. These interventions kicked the can down the road and did not fundamentally strengthen the business model of the failed banks. Within a couple of years, the debt was again at untenable levels. Over the last century, society continued its shift from groups to individuals. The Paleolithic humans of 2.5 million years ago to 10,000 BC were organized around family units and clans. From 10,000 BC to as recently as the 1800s, tribes, clans, and groups still dominated our social structures, and they still do in some cultures today. So for more than 99% of our history, humans have functioned and operated in groups more so than now. With technology, improvements in standards of living, medicine, and food, people of the 20th century had the ability to survive more independently of a clan or group than they ever could before. Community help gave way to self-help. Self-sufficiency was traded for efficiency. 
So we learn new ways to specialize and run supply chains. A computer could be ordered, custom built, and shipped in a few days. Companies found new ways to reduce inventory. Owning all parts of a supply chain became considered quaint. We became efficient and were able to do things that were previously impossible. But a system built on speed and efficiency has fragility. A tomato from Brazil could be delivered to our local chain restaurant for less than the cost of local production. But we lost resiliency. We see now in this crisis the downside of complex supply chains and other systems we've come to rely on. The decade of 2010 to 2020 saw further inflation of the global asset bubble. We closed the decade with record stock performance and record valuations. We also accumulated record levels of debt on a personal, corporate, and national level. Despite the solid market performance, many knowledgeable investors had concerns over asset bubbles. Some have described COVID-19 as the pin that popped the bubble. The impact of the virus and its reaction to it is more like a broadsword than a pin. It has not just popped the bubble, it has shattered much of what came before and shattered any chance of reconstructing the old system. What is happening? The generation and society shifts we see with the destruction of an entire age include a complete rewiring of how systems work and how people think. In the period of around March 2020, the psyche of society and market actors were instantly and permanently changed. The concerns, lifestyle, and buying habits of billions of people were instantly altered. There is no going back. Our old models are no longer effective because they were built for a different world. We cannot assume people will behave as they have in the past because people have changed. All we learned about management, human behavior, and institutions is quickly becoming as irrelevant to our lives as a Victorian era college curriculum. There will be aspects that remain relevant, but much of it is no longer usable. We must learn the new ways our world will work. And in this time, the weakest links are destroyed first. Weak institutions, monetary systems, business models, and weak ideas will be among the first casualties of this change. Sadly, many strong people and businesses will also be destroyed by collateral damage. So what will happen? Chaos and nth order effects. It's like throwing a handful of ball bearings at a string of dominoes. How the chaos and secondary and nth order effects unfold is endlessly complex and unpredictable. In our old world, the illness of a world leader or turmoil in Iran alone could impact the global markets. Today, during this period of cataclysmic change, we have dozens and dozens of such major market and geopolitical events simultaneously unfolding. Large news items are drowned daily by other news. The capital markets cannot process or react to so much change. The individual market participants and decision makers, money managers, traders, CEOs, are also dealing with their own business and personal disruptions. Even without distraction, no analyst or CEO or trader or computer can process the variables and predict what happens next. The potential outcomes are now as difficult to predict as the pattern on a tie-dye t-shirt as the dye is poured over it. You might guess the general color or look, but you can't possibly know how it will unfold. There's just too many variables and too many possibilities. So what may happen? There's areas of concern. Geopolitical conflict is one. 
Above all else, we must watch out for geopolitical risks. To be prepared for an emergency, you always need to plan for a worst case scenario. War and conflict between nations could make the crisis we are in now seem insignificant. The ripple effects of the chaos and change in turn lead to more chaos, change, and unexpected events. The crisis is still in its early stages and the dust has not begun to settle. When the world has more clarity and impact is clearer, we will be at a heightened chance of global conflict. Now will be a time when power players and the evil will try to move forward, a time when authoritarians will try to seize power, and a time when tyrants will try to exercise their will. Politicians will also have to face an increased chance of civil unrest, record unemployment, and deal with frustration by citizens. Chaos begets chaos. Times of crisis are usually not isolated. Turmoil creates new systemic risks. The virus crisis has popped the financial bubble, creating an economic crisis. The reactions by governments have created further crisis. So we now see not only a health crisis of the virus, as well as massive nth order effects on private health, insurance care, and other medical issues, we also see a global supply chain crisis, a jobs crisis, a debt crisis, a looming food crisis, a human rights crisis, a restaurant, hotel, and hospitality crisis, an airline crisis, and a residential and commercial real estate crisis. We could see regional conflicts on the scale of Iraq or Afghanistan wars as various nations vie for power and resources. Unfortunately, we face the possibility of a massive global war as well. Tensions between some nations and China are also likely to increase for a variety of reasons, including nationalism, economics, trade wars, and blame for the virus. Authoritarianism. Global governments have a history of expanding power and authoritarianism in times of crisis. This increases the tax burden on citizens while decreasing the ability of enterprises to operate effectively. The economic impact of the reaction to 9-11, for example, was far greater than the impact of the event itself. We can expect a combination of global restrictions on travel, changes in economic policy, and limitations on trade and movement. The U.S. and other countries could have virus-driven Patriot Act-style legislation and executive orders. We should be cautious of biosurveillance, the delegation of legal due process to medical authorities, and restrictions on free speech. Ideas that may sound good in times of crisis can be difficult to unwind if they give vast new powers to the state. The idea of restricting movement based on a COVID-19 antibody testing, for example, may have some merits from a medical and containment standpoint, but in practical application could have massive downside from a human rights standpoint. Whoever controls the database with the health tracking records controls the people. So a project run by well-meaning doctors today could be co-opted by politicians tomorrow and used as a political tool. If abused, people who are in the wrong political party or say the wrong things might be declared to be in violation of the rules or may have difficulty getting tests or clearances. We can never allow anyone the ability to restrict or lock up others outside of our legal system with due process and constitutional limits on state power. Any power that citizens give up now has a high chance of being abused at some point in the future. Supply chains. Global supply chains were one of the first areas affected by the virus. As factories in China cl closed in January 2019, we saw manufacturers, suppliers, and retailers report an immediate drop in supply for the materials they need. 
It was here when most people on Earth had not heard of the virus that our fragile economic system began to be impacted. The interconnected world relies on many complex moving parts. In Leonard Reed's 1958 essay, I Pencil, Reed describes the complex systems and cooperation needed to create a pencil. Reed chose the simple pencil to illustrate that even simple items require vast cooperation of supplies, manufacturers, and distributors. Today, we have many more complex products and a supply chain that is orders of magnitude above that of 1958. Yet the recent disruptions place severe limitations on our ability to produce, create, and trade, even by 1958 standards. The ripple effects of the supply chain have already wiped out some companies and will continue to be felt for years, with many changes being permanent. The supply chain has many additional effects. Container ships in California are now stacking up with a lack of demand for certain products. Materials used for medicines are in short supply. Radically changed consumer demands are altering the landscape even further. Bad economics. It's never a good time for nonsensical economics. The COVID-19 corporate bonus bailout package was more than $6 trillion by April 1st, 2020. The costs in both taxes and devaluation of money are real and borne by the citizens. This equates to an average of about $18,000 per citizen. So Congress and the Federal Reserve are essentially taking $18,000 from each citizen's wealth, giving $16,800 of it back to corporations, and then returning $1,200 to each citizen in the form of a check, or some citizens anyway. This is a bad deal. How much is $6 trillion? So if Christopher Columbus came to America in 1492 and burned up a pile of cash worth $1,200, then burned another four seconds later and another and another and another, 960 piles of cash an hour, every hour, every day, 24-7, century after century, it still wouldn't amount to $6 trillion. I could go on with silly but also true examples like this, but the main point is that these numbers don't make any sense to any rational person. They are bad economics. Either the principles of economics are sound or they are not. A crisis is no excuse to abandon reason and logic. Due to the nature of this shift and its magnitude, we cannot depend on things working as they have before, especially bad ideas. The dollar is still the leading global currency and, as such, has unique advantages. Other fiat is, for the most part, in bad shape. Even the U.S. dollar is only the reserve currency until it isn't. This crisis may not be the end of the dollar. In fact, the dollar may do well in the near term, although the primary reason is that there is so little else that makes sense. Bonds and other fiat offer an inferior risk and return relative to the dollar change. Further market drops. Stocks are about at 2017 levels and the CAPE ratio, cyclically adjusted price to earnings, are at their 35-year averages. So in other words, even despite the massive market drops for this year, stocks are still relatively high price based on their historic averages. So worse yet, these price-to-earnings ratios are based on trailing earnings, not forecasted earnings. So clearly the earnings of Q2 to Q4 2020 are going to be some of the most dismal in history. Capital creation and destruction. One of the most beautiful things about economics, and something socialists will never understand, is that both capital and value can be created from nothing. So ingredients worth $5 combined with labor can be used to make a cake worth $15. The extra $10 in increased value isn't stolen from someone. Increased value is produced because the value has been created from thin air, raw materials, risk, and labor. So same with a plot of land worth $100,000 combined with building supplies and labor worth another $100,000 can create real estate worth $300,000. A business with R&D or a film company that spends $100 million can create something from thin air 
worth a billion dollars. The flip side of this is that value and capital can be destroyed as well. So when a business fails, the enterprise value is essentially zero, less whatever raw supplies are left. So a restaurant worth a million dollars in January that is out of business today is gone from the balance sheet of Earth. There is less value and we are all poorer as a world. The job market. We are likely to reach unemployment levels not seen since the Great Depression. Perhaps worse. The effects of this are almost inconceivable. We face a world where far fewer people are producing and spending, which makes it much more difficult for the capital that has been destroyed to be recreated. What jobs we do see will be radically different. I started my career, for example, in the 1990s as a stockbroker and investment advisor. In the early 90s, commission-only compensation models were common for financial services, healthcare, others. And this, the models from the 70s and 80s were disappearing in a favor of more of a draw versus commission. So by the 2000s, the, the model was a base plus commission. By 2010, it was a salary with a possible bonus. And by 2019, you know, even the bonuses were there, you almost never saw a commission-based job. And all of this occurred just in the typical shifts of time for a normal 20-year career, not a fourth turning and not an epoch shift. So we can expect the compensation structures and structures of all jobs to follow a much more dramatic path than the financial services over the last 30 years example. It'll be more like the historic shift from farms to factories or factory uh, jobs to office jobs. It will be a massive change, we will see. Power structures and institutions. The power structures built up through the 20th century will die or change. Entities built during the last century, such as post Bretton Woods banking and fractional reserve, the European Union, and institutions like the UN, World Economic Forum, and World Health Organization, will either change radically to adapt to the new world, or more likely will cease to exist as we know them. Many institutions have brought little added value during this crisis, and some, like the WHO, have been outright harmful. So people faced with hardship are less likely to trust institutions, and they will look for proven solutions instead. New organizations will fill the void, as will individuals and especially decentralized interest groups. Long-time establishment groups like the World Economic Forum will be less relevant as global power structures shift and change. Opportunities. Destruction means that something cannot be repaired, but it can be rebuilt. In times of turmoil and war and change, there are opportunities. Along with ruin, this new age will see fortunes built and the next generation of great companies rise from the ashes. The Great Depression saw many new business models, like the creation of the model modern supermarket by Michael Cullen. It saw many small and mid-sized enterprises adapt, lead, and build fortunes. It will be key for entrepreneurs to watch for what works and be ready to spot and adapt and change to emerging trends because the change will come very, very fast. Entertainment. The Great Depression accelerated technology of the entertainment and movie industry, which had only recently had the first talkies, and the industry was hit by the economic downturn like anyone else, but it quickly changed and adapted by lowering ticket prices and producing cheaper B movies. This ushered in a golden age for cinema that lasted until the 1960s. The massive lifestyle changes brought on by this crisis will accelerate an already promising industry in the areas of esports, gaming, and VR, streaming video has reached an inflection point, and already struggling theaters have faced their worst period in history. Even in the darkest times, people still seek refuge in entertainment to help pass the time and ease the pain. So while some parts of the entertainment business will be forever destroyed, the sector itself will survive and ultimately thrive. 
Leading the growth will be new and improved forms of entertainment that will serve the needs of a new style of consumer. Sports. Professional sports have also taken an unprecedented blow with virtually all major games and events canceled. As with the entire economic world, major league sports as we knew them are gone forever, transformed. At the very least, we will see a change in consumer behavior, attendance, and interaction. Depending on how long the lockdowns and closures continue, sports could see a year or more of significant disruption. As with the movie industry of the 1930s, today's sports franchises must be clever and adapt. They should focus on community building, improving broadcasting technology, and finding innovative ways to continue. Major League, League Baseball is reportedly exploring plans to sequester multiple teams in a quarantine zone so they can continue to play. And UFC President Dana White announced that he has secured a private island and a secluded location in the United States for the continuation of the UFC professional MMA matches. So the UFC does about $600 million in annual revenue, and it's particularly well-suited to adapt to a quarantine or physical social distancing type of measure because of the comparatively small number of athletes and simpler logistics involved with MMA fighting. So what we love about sports remains the same, the best of the best, the teamwork, and the nearly superhuman abilities of the athletes. This will live on, but the presentation and format may be quite a bit different. Technology. The multifaceted crisis we're in will accelerate some things which are, offer better efficiency or savings over old models. Distance communications such as Zoom, Google, uh, also AI, decentralized finance, Bitcoin and blockchain technology, drones, various medical devices, new types of software, all may provide solutions to the new problems we face in the new world. Decentralization will likely be a major theme of the new world, and technologies that enable this may do well. Finance. Distressed real estate. Almost all real estate is likely to have a major drop in value. Residential real estate will be harmed by less appetite for purchases, as well as missed and falling rents. Commercial real estate is especially vulnerable due to the trifecta of out-of-business tenants, such as hospitality, economically harmed commercial tenants, less demand, and a general move toward work from home. So we may see some cities have record drops in real estate, and in some cases, a flight from cities could change their appeal and make the problem even worse. Gold, silver, metals, the dollar, fiat, and Bitcoin. In times of financial crisis and the devaluation or debasement of currencies, more people tend to pay attention to money, inflation, and how money works. Gold has been a stable, inflation-resistant store of value and money of last resort for people and governments for thousands of years. We see record demand for physical gold with decoupling from leveraged paper gold. Gold presents an appealing hedge and should be considered a part of all portfolios. Bitcoin and what is money? So money has six properties, divisibility, acceptance, durability, fungibility, scarcity, and uniformity. There's a lot of works you can read about this. The US dollar, gold, and Bitcoin each have trade-offs in this evaluation of what is money. Bitcoin remains a very risky and speculative asset, but its basic properties, it has a limited supply, a strong network, make Bitcoin a worthwhile option to consider for risk-oriented investors. Bitcoin remains a binary play of sorts, likely to either fail or do far, far better. And the global and economic turmoil of fiat is just crazy enough that it could tip the scales to Bitcoin enough for this narrative to change. Localization. 
The fragility brought with globalization and outsourcing will likely be countered with a partial move to more self-sufficiency, personal responsibility, and localization. So quaint ideas of businesses owning their own real estate or controlling their own supply chain might become popular again. As we see record unemployment, uh, work habits will shift. Maybe people will stay at companies longer, for example. Reduced travel and increased reliance on the community can increase localization. Today, the companies so far least impacted by this crisis are those that are most isolated and insulated. Those hit hardest are the ones that are the most interconnected. Decentralization. Along with localization, decentralization is another existing trend that has been accelerated by the crisis. The decentralization brought on by business models and technology such as file sharing, open source software, and cryptocurrencies offer their own forms of anti-fragility and resilience, especially in times like this. Decentralized distributed systems are typically run by large numbers of volunteers or companies. They are capable of scaling very fast and they can be very, very difficult to kill. So the immediate medical and logistics needs of this crisis spawned many instant open source projects. These efforts included medical devices like ve ventilators, fabrications, masks, design, research for uh, vaccines, sourcing of key supplies, and existing open source decentralized projects might be strengthened by the kinds of change that this sort of shift brings about. Stocks and capital markets. Clearly, the global stock markets are going through the biggest change in the last 100 years. The entire structure, who the players are, and how the markets work will change. The destruction of this crisis will impact finance more than most sectors. Again, innovation will be key. Innovative structures with the capabilities of serving a new world must be developed. Tokenizing digital securities offer advantages over the old system, for example. As the financial markets face the increased strain, more frictionless models may become more appealing. Digital stocks and bonds and other tools can help with capital creation and formation that will be needed. Just like co-ops became popular in the Great Depression, we may see entirely new or unusual structures of ownership we haven't thought about before. Changes in how enterprises form and work, how markets operate and are financed. Global change. Asia, China, the EU, and the rest of the world will see major changes. The EU was weakening and Brexit occurred just as the COVID-19 crisis started. Some areas will be hit harder than others based on economics, debt levels, and other factors. Some countries in Africa will benefit from a much lower proportional impact due to far younger demographics and more resiliency, resources and a lower impact of the virus or the economic shutdowns. Unstable countries like Iran and Venezuela may see regime change or regional conflict. The impact, we will remember this forever. People will painfully learn how economics work and much of what we took for granted will be missed. However, the need for rebuilding is so great that we are in for a hopefully positive time in human history. Most people have not generally understood economics, production, supply and demand, productivity, efficiency, and trade. This painful lessons of the virus and its secondary and nth order effects will make economic realities clearer. People will experience Hayek's road to serfdom firsthand. Like many lessons, some will just fill in their own excuses, but others will learn, grow, and improve our world. Solutions. Laissez-faire economics. Good economic principles work and are needed now more than ever. Austerity. We must cut government and corporate spending and be frugal on a personal and government level. 
We should ask fundamental questions like, is central planning good? We should have healthy debate. We must avoid communism and socialism and corporatism and other failed ideologies. It's innovation, not authoritarianism, which will be what helps us out of this. The geeks will save us. We know how to innovate. We know how to iterate, scale. Geeks know how to solve problems. In this myth or hero's journey, it's the time of the techies and the builders to save and rebuild our world. The technocrats and authoritarians need to get out of the way. Don't restrict people. Let them unleash their creativity and find solutions that work. Some actions to take now. Whether you are a billionaire, an Uber driver, a top venture capitalist, an investment banking partner, farmer, or a wage worker at a casino, you are in the economic fight of your life. You need to plan, prepare, and have backup plans for each eventuality and worst case scenario. We need to be cautious, trust, but verify twice. Be flexible, be open-minded. No one gets wrecked who, who thought it would be them. Plan for a scenario 10 times worse than the current. Look for constants, principles, and values that are relevant in any situation. Math, science, logic, and other pursuits are independent of global events. It will be the hardest time we've seen. Be a leader. This too shall pass. As Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. At least it's attributed to him. So in conclusion, there's no greater change and no greater opportunity. As we learn a new way collectively, it is an opportunity to lead in the new fields and build our new world. Now is the time to reinvent yourself and do what you wish. You can rebuild your firm or enterprise the way you have always wanted. We have discussed where we are, how we got here, the magnitude of the change, and what our world may look like as the future unfolds. With the destruction of an era comes the birth of a new one. Much like the melancholy we feel when we're moving from a home, we may tear up as the yellow moving van drives down the driveway one last time, but we soon feel relief and excitement about what is next. We may not know what to expect in our new home, but it will have some bad and some good. The new world we see born of this shift is ours to make of it what we wish. It is a time for the bold, for leaders, for builders, for visionaries, and for dreamers who can think outside the box. The old is gone and cannot be repaired, only rebuilt. The new world is a green field of opportunity. It is time for us to build something better than we ever had before. This will happen. New technologies, advances, changes in governance and ideas will be implemented. Problems will be solved. We will be okay. We will build and learn and create and grow. That is what humans do. It is what we have always done. All that remains is to decide what role we will have. Thank you.